Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Eclectica. I'm Michael Seven Michael, and we have our man on the West Coast. Drew, how you doing? Good. Catching up on sleep and TV shows and not being productive. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Speaking of TV shows, you were telling me that Preach is coming back? Yeah, tonight's the night. That's one of the shows that I've been trying to grind away on. I've missed the last, I think it was like the last three or four episodes. So I'm trying to play catch up. It premieres season two tonight. It is uh, Seth Rogen bringing us <laughs> strange, strange fire. Wait, when it Seth comes to Rogen's in it? Seth Rogen, he's behind this show. Yeah, that, this is his. This that. is his. Wow. It was the Garth Ennis comic book. And I was, what was the other guy's name? I don't say it's like Mark Dillon. Mm -hmm. uh, their comic started way back in 2000, had its run. Um, it's strange, it's brutal, and it's everything that you would come to expect from a Garth Ennis comic book and its oddity and just how uh, it's crude, but in its own way, it's almost kind of like elegant with how he weaves these really macabre, messed up stories with these layered, really screwed up characters. Mm -hmm. And whether you love it or hate it, you know it when you see it. He's a very distinct uh, storyteller, Garth Ennis. Now, so the show... Know, if you didn't know that Seth Rogen had anything to do with it, would you even think that he would be connected to this project? Yeah, because it's very much his alley when it comes to the types of comedy that he has in his, in his, uh, in his films. Mm -hmm. It's base, it's crude, it's raunchy a lot of the times, and it's in its own way oddly profound. That falls right into the medium I think that Garth Ennis is known for. So when I heard that he was interested in, I think it was initially for the longest time, Preacher was supposed to be a film. Okay. And from minute one, I'm just like, you can't tell that story in like two hours, not even three hours, because there's wow. just so much ground to cover. Right. There's so many bizarre characters and they have their own motivations for doing things. You can't tell that type of story and have it stick with people. Uh, Jesse Custer, the main character, Tulip, another main character, and uh, Jesse, the, other, the Irish vampire dude, they each have whole sections of the comic dedicated just to developing them as characters. And when you have that kind of time mm -hmm. to tell that kind of story, it's great. Chopped down to a two hour movie, it sucks ass. So you have to tell it in just the right way. Mm -hmm. And I think they did it at AMC. Um, they had to take certain liberties. They changed a lot of the story around. They focus on, I don't know if you how much of season one you watched, but um, they focus on the town Anvil, Anvil, Texas. That's where we find Jesse and the others at the beginning of the story. They focus on that a lot more in season one, when really Anvil didn't last past issue one in the in the comic. Mm -hmm. uh, it gets completely just decimated, and it took them an entire season to get to that point. I think that was good that they did that, because if they'd started there and just instantly destroyed Anvil in season one, or in episode one, that would have been a bit of a rush. You don't have time to set up the characters and all that other good stuff before then. So You said something very interesting the last show when mm. we were talking about Black Panther and how it was great that he was in Civil War. Yeah. And they basically did the backstory, so they don't really have to go through that with the Black Panther movie. They could really just keep They can just jump forward. to the thick of it, yeah. Right, yeah. But, so it's... now I, when I think about that, I think it's interesting that Margot Robbie and um, David Iyer um, Ratim. Beg your pardon? Um, David Iyer. You know, David the, Iyer, the guy that he directed Suicide Squad. Right, and he's working on the DC Sirens. Yeah, um, and again, this is just yeah. Warner Brothers and DC being reactionary to everything that Marvel does. Um, but do you think that with, I, because of that's a lot. I mean, to put Poison Ivy, uh -huh. um, Catwoman, and we haven't really seen a really good Catwoman yet. Um, no. Well, no, that's not true. That's not true. Well, um, Pfeiffer, yes, yes. But I mean, Pfeiffer as and far as the her, best one of all, Eartha Kitt. Come on, man. Give props. Julie okay. Newmar. Come wait, on, wait, wait, man. Wait, let me, <laughs> I'm saying as far as a film. As far as the we, films, no. As, I'm, and should I'm I giving, say I'm a, giving, a, a standalone film? I know. you give me shots. I'm just giving you a hard time. <laughs> so, but we haven't seen a standalone um, Catwoman, um, and we haven't seen a standalone uh, Poison Ivy either. 
We've never seen uh, in the films. We only got the, the really crappy Uma Thurman one, and she's a good actress, so that one was totally kind of like, oh god, that it happened. It wasn't her fault. That wasn't her wasn't fault. Wasn't her fault. That was just a bad movie. And when it comes to Catwoman, we had Michelle Pfeiffer, who was good, who was supposed to get her own spinoff film, mm-hmm. but that never came to be. And then we have Halle Berry getting in, you know, number two of stinker performances of a superhero, and with Catwoman that mm-hmm. we all collectively just groan and try not to lose our lunches over. So, and again, there's a lot of buzz of who these, who's going to play. I mean, obviously Margot Robbie, you know, her. Margot she, Robbie's going to be Harley Quinn. But right. see, yeah, to answer your other question before, that's just I feel like that's just them doubling down on the Harley Quinn mm-hmm. effect, because everyone liked her costume in the first one, and she was probably one of the funner characters in the Suicide Squad movies. Yeah. But that's just let's just do more of that with her hitting stuff with a bat, and then just add some other females on it. Which could work if you have it around a better film and have a better cast of characters that she can work with. Right. Her and Harley, I mean, Harley Quinn and Poison Ivy have a pretty rich history in the comics, so they could play off that. Hopefully it's not just, hey guys, we're trying to make them, get them to make out. I hope there's more to their dynamic than that, because there right. is more to it. And if they took Scott Snyder's action model that he had in Sucker Punch, which was another crappy film, but it had really good action sequences, mm-hmm. and make that... That could be dope. That could it, work. It, it could be dope. And again, the that whole point of me much. bringing that up was not only the fact that it's happening, but mm-hmm. um, I'm very, very, very curious to see what they're going to do with the backstory of these characters. Are they really going to develop them? Is it going to be three simultaneous stories? You know, where are they going to go? And they, and they have to have either Joker or Batman in this. And, no, they and, don't, but they probably will. I mean, you could... <laughs> it's possible oh. to tell a Gotham story without having Batman or Joker or any of the other characters thrown in your face just to remind you, hey, this is the place where these guys live. It's been done. Um, Gotham PD, like that whole series, it focuses on the police officers of Gotham and Batman is kind of like in the periphery. It takes you and puts you in the right. seat of the normal Gothamite right. and shows you how messed up the town really is. So well, it doesn't have to happen, well, but they, they'll throw them in there undoubtedly. Well, it's interesting because Batman's a child. He's not Batman yet. He's still young Bruce Wayne on the TV version. In the so, TV version, yeah. 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 So, but if so you notice, yep. the last season one, he shows up and he's there. He's a presence. He has an arc. Right. And then season one, or sorry, season two, from what I heard from parts that I've seen, they make it so mini Batman centric that it's almost like, okay, so he's meeting all these other characters in his childhood. Right. Catwoman or cat girl at the time, she's living with him in Wayne Manor. Like he's going and meeting all these other characters that he's not supposed to even know about right. for like another, at least another decade or so. So what, what's so, your prediction? Do you think they're gonna do it right with the backstories of these characters? Or? They could. I mean, it's the ball's in their court at this point. At this point, they know that they can create a good character because, as we saw with Wonder Woman, right, which was probably the best when it comes to the DC films that they've made thus far. It's my second favorite, only next to Man of Steel, because I thought that one was just altogether a really good telling of Superman. Mm-hmm. Wonder Woman was a really great character-driven story. It it made you. How can I explain it? They gave you a reason as to why she was a hero, besides other people telling you that she's heroic. If right. that makes any sense, you know, like they made her a person first, then a warrior, then she was a princess, and then she became a demigod at the end. It's a st- it's a tale of ascension. You know exactly why she gets from point A to point B and how. So, uh, if they can do that again, great. If psycholo- not, don't bother. Psychologically, did you find it interesting that she would she kind of had the fight of Batman? But she was, she had that innocence, very, um, well, just being naive of Superman. Mm. He was very, very naive. And, and She was super naive. She had, yeah, that's, that's her arc. She starts yeah. off as a very naive young, she starts off as a Disney princess, <laughs> and then she becomes a demigoddess at the end. And I right. thought that was so rad how they were able to pull right. that off and still make her likable. Gal Gadot is super likable as Wonder Woman in this one. Mm-hmm. I can't even get over how adorable she was in some, in yeah. some scenes. Like, it was dope. And then she stepped up, and she became a freaking hero, and you totally understood why and, and how that came to be. It was totally you, rad. You gave me really, like, two really good transitions. Um, mm-hmm. But let, we'll go with the princess one first, and then go with the gods one second. You know where I'm going with Okay. It. So, right, um, 
as you know, Princess Leia was supposed to be mm -hmm. a very important part of the next Star Wars movie. And, yeah. um, you know, Carrie Fisher passed away. So I'm hearing rumors now they emotionally they had to pick themselves up. And now the work of, well, how do we tell this story without what are the main focuses of the story? Um, it's going to be very interesting to see where they're going to go with it with that. Um, because they basically had to okay. rewrite most of the film. Okay. According yeah, to I rumors, mean, according to rumors. Yeah, yeah, according to rumor. See, that's an interesting thing you brought up because the second Star Wars film that's about to come out, you have this idea that there's the passing of the torch. Correct. We kind of jump. We kind of see. We kind of did this earlier when the first one came out because we were making our predictions and we were like, "Yo, Ray's gonna become badass Jedi. Right. Finn's gonna become badass military leader. Poe's <laughs> gonna become badass pilot." And in the second film, you have this not aura but you have this tone where it's like luke is ending the jedi and starting something new with ray because there's two of them now right. and his whole thing is that the jedi have to end the theory of that is is because there's the jedi and there's the sith and that's causing chaos so what do you do you eradicate both sides of that spectrum to eradicate the chaos mm -hmm. um in the wake of carrie fisher which is a great you know loss for all of us mm -hmm. like there's this idea that the mantle maybe from from Ray to Luke, right? Mm -hmm. Finn is to Princess Leia. Mm -hmm. That's my that's my theory about that. Mm -hmm. So I know she did film her scenes before she passed away, so she will be in this next one. It'll be super weird seeing her character after that. But like the third film, which will pick up I think like another year or two, mm -hmm. um, that will show the after effect of that. So it'll be really cool to see Finn kind of become the prince, not the, <laughs> as weird as it may sound, see Finn become the Princess Leia character of this new Star Wars tale, right? <laughs> right. While Rey becomes like the new Luke Skywalker right. for, our, for our generation, you know? Right. So that could be a pretty, and then of course Poe would be like our, our millennial Han Solo, right. just significantly less cooler. And you know, some of the rumors is that um, Finn is the son of Mace Windu. Have you heard that one? I did hear about that one. I'm just kind of like, I don't, I don't, <laughs> nah, nah. You're not gonna let yeah. that happen. Nah. Are you talking about Finn being the son of Mace Windu? Correct. I don't like that because one, it's too clean, it's too predictable of all the kids in the universe. I don't like that idea because it makes it seem like unless you're directly connected to the characters that we've seen in the prequels, that you can't matter. Like, that's interesting. you know, I never, yeah. Ray, yeah, if we come to find out Ray is actually Luke's kid, it's like, oh, all right. I suppose. All right, we'll let that one slide. But to also find out that, oh, yeah, the only reason that Finn is special is because he came from the testicles of Mace Windu. I'm like, oh, really? So basically, if you're black, you better know Samuel Jackson and be related to him. Otherwise, you ain't nothing. That sucks. Then what, what else are you going to tell me? Poe is actually like another illegitimate kid of like Han Solo who he had before he met Leia. Well, there's another theory Come that on. even with the Emperor is that um, Anakin, you know, they never really totally explained who Anakin's father was. And they're, so, they're trying, what, you think they might try to go the route of, oh, my God. The uh, Emperor's son, because remember, he did say a line, I'm going to turn you like my father before me. They used that more than once. It could, the thing about so, it is, we right. joke, but it could happen. Like, right. we've seen stuff. Tropes like this are pretty common. We find out that everybody's related. Fist of the North Star did it. Um, right. They were infamous for that. Everybody was everybody's brother and dead and thought dead relative. Right. They could do that for Star Wars because at its core, it's, a, it's your traditional, it's not a whole, your traditional hero's tale mm -hmm. where that tends to be like a recurring thing. Luke, I am your father. That's like always a thing. It's, it's common now. Right. So they could go that route. I think that they just kind of be doing their characters a bit of a disservice by... The only reason you're special is because you're related to these people from the old movies. It's, it's so condescending and just so whack. Like, can't, they can't just be great characters. Ray just can't be a great Jedi. <laughs> Finn just can't be a great military leader. Really, they all got to be related to the old folks. <laughs> Come on now. We can do better. We can tell. We can do better. So yeah. that's just me. Though. That's just me. That's interesting. Um, what else we got going on today? Well. Um, oh, well, you said that Ron Howard 
it's going to take over the Han Solo prequels? Yeah, so since we're on Star Wars news, uh, that's been the official word that Ron Howard, the well-known Hollywood director, he's going to be taking over the helm of the next Star Wars film. The, I guess it's the in-between movies, between the main chapters. Mm -hmm. Han Solo prequel, uh, we've been talking about it for, I want to say, like two, three years now. Easy. And it's going, it's happened. My only thing about that is it's like, all right, we know that we're going to get competent performances from our actors now. But when it comes to his style, what do we really know Ron Howard for? Like, well, backpack? that's interesting because I worked with him and he's super uh -oh, meticulous. You're flexing. You're flexing. Yeah, a little flexing, a little you're flexing. flexing a little bit, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I worked with Ron Howard, Drew. And, so, uh, uh, as it turns out, I think, uh, yeah. I, I, you know what? I, I think that's why it's so exciting because we haven't really seen him tell this kind of story. I mean, we've yeah. seen comedic stuff. We saw, like, Splash, if you go way mm -hmm. back in the archives. You, yeah. you know, you backdraft, like you said, as far as building mm -hmm. the tension. Um, mm -hmm. make, uh, political, social stuff, like the paper, the one that I'm in. Yeah, <laughs> he's, he's kind Flexing. of all over the place as yeah. a director, yeah. Um, so it's hard to call. And um, so, yeah, I think it would be totally, totally interesting to see where he goes. And this opens him, I, I think he's going to put a lot of energy into it because mm -hmm. this opens him up to so many other films. And since this yeah, is the, yeah, yeah. the, the way you know, Halloween's going, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you know, like Clockwork, there's going to be a cameo with his brother in there at some point. Well, oh, you know what? Now that you mentioned that, uh, oops. Did, did, you, did you freeze on me, sir? Let's see what's going on. Hold on, Drew. Ladies and gentlemen, we are live. Let's see. Let's call Drew back. Shout out to Skype. You guys really making it happen for us there. And I think I'm back. And you're back. So. All right. I don't know what happened, but sure. His let's, daughter let's, uh, might be in, into it. That was the. You ever think of that? His, his daughter. <laughs> That's the, the technical difficulties. Technical difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So anyway, like we were saying, I said Ron uh, Howard's so yeah, daughter. Ron Howard. His his daughter might be into, and um, he might put his daughter. Bryce Dallas Howard. She yeah. she could she yeah. could. I mean, I wouldn't be half surprised if I did. So that's what I'm saying. We can only speculate as to who he'll put in the movie, but right. style wise, tone wise, right. we don't know anything about this. And I'm kind of glad it's the, it can't really be called a gripe at the end of the day. I'm just all right. We'll see what happens. Well, we'll get some uh, pretty so solid performances. You, you, you know we're going to get better, because he's directing it, you're going to get better acting in it. Um, mm -hmm. And technically, you know, there's going to be a lot of great direction. Is there going to be it'll a be, really yeah. good story? It'll be directed That's confident. the thing. Yeah. Will the yeah, story yeah. be great? And which is the question that we asked earlier on, as soon as we heard they were going to do an Han Solo, you know, prequel, you know, a backstory mm -hmm. um, situation, is like, Mm. Is there a story there? I mean, it's a great character, and you could create a lot of different things with the smuggling, and it's almost endless. It, it almost could be a TV series rather than a film. You could, yeah, you could turn that into like a, a space buddy drama between uh, Childish Gambino and the young Han Solo. That, that could work. Right. Um, I'm thinking, see, because I made a couple predictions as to that. I'm like, mm -hmm. it's not going to be him back in like some like, academy type of thing. I think if they're going to try to work that into like a two hour movie, mm -hmm. it's going to be, if not Han Solo's very first smuggling job, the one that made him famous. He comes in kind of known, you know, he's like a rookie, he's a hot shot, he's, he has people turning their heads, right. but he hasn't quite established himself as a known smuggler yet. Or it could be the Parsec thing, the test, the, what was it, the, the, the race that he apparently said that he won? Remember that one? Oh, that's right, yeah, yeah, never, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To be the fastest ship in the in the galaxy. To prove it could be that run where he proved himself the fastest ship in the galaxy. That could be his like hero oh, too. If you get that right, we got to play this episode back because that'd be hilarious. I'm telling like, you, like, we don't. Yeah, yeah, I haven't. Uh, well, I've been checking in periodically over the last couple weeks for mm -hmm. what's been up with the the Star Wars films. Mm -hmm. They haven't given us too much, if you notice, about Han Solo, which I like. Keep it under wraps. Don't tell us ish. Just let us watch it, <laughs> you right, know? Right, right, right. So, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, that'd be, it's going to be super interesting. Mm -hmm. um, just random, for those musicians out there, the composer 
for Ant-Man will uh, will return. Who's uh, who's the composer for Ant-Man again? I don't even know. I just know he's going to return. Okay. I don't want to lie to the people. I don't get it wrong. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll find that. <laughs> we'll find that for you momentarily because now you got me thinking, wait, wait, should I be hyped for this? Should I? Uh... Actually, yeah, you know, I just want to uh, get all the... Um, musical the composing geeks give them some information i feel like we're leaving them out every time we do a show so I'll figure okay so that out <laughs> the fellow that i have for that one is chris uh christoph beck okay he's the guy that did he's the music composer for ant man um was it that amazing that, up, that we were like, i said were there any particular music in that film that you were like oh my goodness he's coming back no nah, man like because i'm thinking ant-man what was so hot about the soundtrack for ant-man i mean not that it was bad, I just don't recall it all that much. If you mm -hmm. had said the Wonder Woman soundtrack or Junkie XL be coming back, I'd be like, oh, God. He made probably one of my least favorite DC theme songs ever. And then if you said Hans, uh, Hans Zimmer was about to go throw down this, I'd be like, oh, yeah, yeah, let's go. The, the soundtrack king. Uh, oh, and um, I know this is going to get you amped because you've mentioned this several times about the Aquaman film. It is uh -huh. official. Production is in full swing for Aquaman. They're yeah, they're going with that one. They're going and with jump, it. Sorry, to jump, sorry, to jump, I'm still kind of stuck on the Ant-Man thing. Right. To jump back on that for right. one second, I thought you were trying to be slick okay. and use the music angle to plug uh, the girl that's going to be in the next one, who basically is like everything. If there's, there, if there's the archetypal seven girl, it is her. <laughs> Oh, really? <laughs> and if you look her up and you're able to post a picture of her, oh, man. Now I, go, I will okay. totally be like, see, exhibit A, ladies okay, and gentlemen. Okay, and man, and this is this, um, playing which, which character? Um, you know what? I'm going to find that out. But this is going to be for uh, Ant-Man and Wasp. It's, of course, obviously the sequel to uh, your other Ant-Man, which did shockingly well, in my opinion. Um, a lot talk, more people. You talk about than Hannah. Was... Hannah John, Cayman. What was the name again? Run that by me again. Hannah John Cayman. Yep, that's her. Hannah John Cayman, or Common, because I think of Common Writer when I, when I see her. Remember your last name? Okay. She's been in some stuff, and she's basically just all you. And she's gonna be a character in the next one. And the minute that I saw her advertise, you notice how in all these superhero movies are like doubling down on like light skin chicks now. They're just like scoop up every pretty light-skinned chick you could find. We need to put them in these superhero movies, damn it. <laughs> Grab every true. Zendaya you can find off the streets. That is put true. Put them in these damn movies post-haste. That, that's <laughs> that's why um, even here talking about Zoe um, Kravitz, they're trying to Zoe Kravitz. put her in every and everything. Um, she's already been in, uh, like, ten, well, yeah, she's already been in one X-Men movie. She showed up for, like, a split second in the second one, but as a, as a dead body, which is bad. But, so yeah. here's here's the young lady that uh, Drew is talking about. Yeah, Ms. that's Hannah. basically. <laughs> just put like a little a little arrow, and then just have it be just like sevens, hashtag sevens bagels, and then just have like some fly this some fly stuff right there. If we could add that. Oh my goodness. <laughs> that would be there. No but comment. But she's uh, I've seen some of her stuff. She's good. I like her. Um, I'm not sure as to who she's gonna play yet. Mm -hmm. I think I've seen it as just like to be announced or something like that. So I'm like, all right, I guess right. maybe she'll be like, I, I could picture as being like the 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 Ant Man's equivalent of like a Bond girl or like yeah. the the henchwoman for like the next big bad. Mm -hmm. She has that look to her. That's interesting. And uh, but yeah, I thought that's where you're going with that initially to round oh, all okay. that down. <laughs> okay, no, no, no. Oh, and we got to talk about our boy Peel before we go. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very interesting news. Now they put they spent about four point five million on Get Out. Yeah, and it made about two hundred twenty nine million, <laughs> which is a huge win for them. Yeah, so now they're trying to throw him more money. And he's make hey, you know that thing that you did with that movie. Right. Do that all over again so we can get some more money. Like. Right. And you know right. what he said? He he turned down a lot of money. He said, no, I'm not going to do it. I want a modest budget. I don't really need that much to tell a story. Yeah. And um, so he's going to take, he's so humble, he's going to take $25 million instead. <laughs> so that's great. Which is, well, Which is no, awesome. I think that's, I mean, you joke. We were, right, 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 I think right. that was you throwing some fire. No, but, no, I'm just um, trying to be funny. no, but I mean, it's funny because so many people are starving to try to get any kind of budget or as yeah, much as possible. Yeah, to get any kind of funny. I hear you. I totally and, hear you. And it's and like, oh, um, wow. 
Yeah. I'll take, yeah, well, I'll, five I'll take million. this mount. Right, right. Uh, I'll take this one. But, yeah, it's but, fine. But he's super smart, though. Super smart. And he's like, because realistically, he needed the amount he needed to make the film that he did. And, and the qual and for, yeah, for the quality of film that we got, as well it was written, as right. well it was acted, that you got every ounce out yeah. of that four million. So if you that's a that's a modest increase, I feel. That's fair. That is fair. He, he's already proven that he can make a good film on like not a shoestring budget, but a modest budget. Mm -hmm. Give him twenty five million so we could add up up the scale a little bit more, maybe have a couple more city locales, mm -hmm. you know, add some actors. That Effects. covers your advertising campaign. So th that's fair. He can make some dope movies with, with 25 million. It was really smart, too, because um, allegedly he was quoted as saying that, well, if I took the amount of money they wanted to give me, mm -hmm. I would have studio heads constantly on set. I'd have all these people saying, so I, I need see. to do this, I need to do yep. that. No, you need yep. to change this. No, just give me the lowest amount that you'll just stay out of my hair. So you can just stay the hell out of my face. Yeah, exactly. And, and Which is the smart. Movie I want to make. Business right. standpoint, it's totally smart. Because you, exactly that. The higher the budget, and I'm learning this as I'm studying the industry and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. The higher the budget that you have, the more people are going to have your hands in your project because that's a lot of investors. Yeah. Like, unless you have some, like, super secret Illuminati type dude back in your project, right. you're, that money that you're getting to fund your film or your project, there's going to be people that are poking their heads in trying to, like, you know, stir the pot. So that's a smart move on his part. $25 million, that's a dope budget. He can go in. He can cover the cost of the actors that he has, whatever special effects he's trying to use, get some better locations, and just go. As long as his writing is on point, he should be fine. Sure. And, um... Are we doing a part two to today? What do you think? Um, if, you, if you want, if there's anything else that we can run over. Um... Cool. So, ladies and gentlemen, we'll see you next time. Um, so, anyone wants to stay for overtime? Minutes. Yeah. Yeah, just, overtime. OT. Just stay for overtime for us. And uh, you're watching Eclectica.